Eye of Bunkaku is different from other anime I've seen. If you look through the seasonal charts for any given season, you will see a lot of adaptations, mostly manga and light novels, and then you'll get a few video game adaptations along with a couple original series if you're lucky. But Eye of Bunkaku, instead of adapting recent media, instead chooses to adapt six well-known works of Japanese literature from the 20th century. Have I gotten your interest yet? Or are you now getting painful flashbacks to your high school English class? Your reaction will probably tell you if this is a show for you or not. So, to review this anime, I'm first going to go over the pros and cons that are across all stories before getting into each one individually for a little bit. One of the things that stands out to me about all these stories is the artistic style that the animators bring to them. Most of the time the animation is kind of normal, but there are a couple times each episode and then they'll really get into the characters' minds to bring their thoughts to life, along with telling the story in a really unique way. One of my favorite examples of this was during the Run Mello story, where the main character was a playwriter and then the characters in the play were acting out the scene on the desk in front of him. Another thing that I liked about the series was that the narrator was talking at the start of each story, giving a little bit of historical context about the story and the authors. And this really helped us to understand the stories, especially since a lot of them were somewhat autobiographical. Though there were some issues that were across all the stories. Most of this revolved around how short each story was, and therefore the pace that they had to be told. This led to pretty minimal character exploration, and the characters are not the type that are just easy to get into right away, and so I did not like any of these stories as much as I could have. One of the keys to a good story is having characters that the viewer cares about in some way, and when there isn't enough time to get attached to them, everything else just falls flat. So going over the stories individually, first is No Longer Human. A name you might recognize if you watched Stray Dogs last year. It tells the story of a man going through life dealing with the struggles of his past and trying to find acceptance and a place to belong. In the first episode, he tried committing a double suicide with a girl, though he lived and now lives with the pain of those events. This is one of the stories that I can say is really deep and mature and unique, especially for anime, and the journey the characters go on is really interesting, but I still found it to just be pretty boring. There are some time skips between each episode which made the story feel disjointed, and at the beginning I just didn't care about really anything. It did get a little bit better by the end, but the twist just really did not have the type of impact, or at least not as much as they could have had. The next story is In the Forest Under the Cherries in Full Bloom, which is a love story between a woman and a mountain bandit. It is easily the worst of the six stories here because the characters were just completely unlikable and the actions of the main guy did not make any sense unless you claim that he was in love but there's like no justification for why he'd be in love or any feeling of romantic feelings that he had toward her. I guess you could say this is about the true nature of humanity or something but that just feels like it's reaching to justify a boring story. There were also some attempts at comedy here and a talking bore thing which just did not fit at all and I don't know why I was here so yeah. I I don't have anything good to say about this story. I guess her song was kind of neat, but yeah, that's all. Then there's Koriko, which is a story about a love triangle between a young man, a girl whose family he lives with, and an older man that he is friends with and admires. What makes this story interesting is that the first episode is told from the young man's perspective with him as the hero, and then the second is a retelling of the same events, but from the older man's perspective with him as the hero instead. This is another case where the short time really hurt the show, as I did not care about the characters and therefore the events of the story. While I did like the different perspectives, it still does not feel as if we got the true story because of the differences between the two episodes, and there are some questions raised in the first episode that just weren't answered at all in the second. I guess you could say that that is the point, because that's how life is and it's hard to get a true objective perspective, but in fiction at least things are supposed to make sense. The fourth story, and my personal favorite of these, is Run Mellows. It tells the story of a playwriter who is writing an adaptation for the Greek play Melos. But he finds that as he writes the play, there are a lot of connections to his own life and his past, forcing him to face these demons. I really liked how it tied the two stories together, with each one sort of telling and explaining the other. This is one I did really connect to, in part because of the ideas of regret and questioning the past. I cannot say that this is great though, because of the limited time for the story and thereby limiting the impact, but I still enjoyed this one from beginning to end. Plus, I love the writing here with some of the lines of dialogue. And I also like that this is a more optimistic tale, but I can admit this is a matter of taste. The fifth story here is The Spider's Thread. This is a one episode story and I liked it for the style that it had. It is about a criminal who basically kills without any remorse and then tries to kill a king and then he is stopped. The art style here is really remarkable and the story here is kind of interesting, though with a short story it was definitely a style over substance episode which ended up making it unique and fun. So yeah, another one I like. 
And lastly is Hellscreen. This one is about a painter who works for an evil king and is told to paint the glories of the kingdom, but instead of that he paints the terrible suffering that he has seen around him caused by the king. This story did have some rather shocking moments, but they just did not have much power, and it seems like the original novel tried to get into the artist's descent into madness, but it really wasn't shown in the anime, which could have been really good to see and made it have more impact, but as it was, it was kind of just meh, though again, neat style helps some. So, overall, would I recommend this anime? Well, um, uh, kind of? Each of these stories present interesting ideas that most modern anime don't, and I like how it is a lens into Japanese literature and the works of these famous authors. But I still found these stories to be pretty dull at times. The narrator at the start of each episode says that these works are evergreen because they're masterpieces, but based off the adaptation, I don't see what makes these works evergreen when they largely fail at giving me a main character I want to root for, which is fundamental to pretty much any good story Telling. Now I'm not saying that the series is all bad because there were aspects I liked and I can appreciate how some of this just was not to my taste. And I do feel like there is a sort of timeless aspect to some of these characters, but even then, when I don't care about the characters, then yeah, the rest just doesn't matter. Though I will say Grunmelis is a good enough arc for me to recommend, but even then, it's not that great. So, in conclusion, I give Ayabangaku a final score of a 4.7 out of 10 and a rating of worth checking out. This may seem like a low score to give even a partial recommendation to, but I can definitely see how it would have an appeal to those different than me. And I feel that the show also has a lot of historical significance because it is an adaptation of so many well-known Japanese uh, books. So it should not be completely written off. For recommendations of similar shows, I would first suggest another show that I do not like all that much, and that is Showa Gengaku Rakugo Shinju, because that is a unique, mature, historical show that I found to be boring and uninteresting. But if you like Ayabangaku, then you probably will like Showa as well, and vice versa. The second recommendation would be for Perfect Blue, because it is somewhat similar to Scent into Madness as some of the characters here, though just not shown as well. So that concludes my review. I know that at least one of my viewers is a big fan of this show, and unfortunately I did not enjoy it as much as I would have hoped, but maybe now I can at least spread the word about a show that doesn't appeal to me, though it may appeal to others. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I will see you all next time.